East Forest. It's an honor, a pleasure. Great to be with you. Yeah. Hey, brother. Last time I saw you was in California. Yeah, in Mammoth. That was a that was a great time. It was great to connect and good to hang out with you and Radha. It was beautiful. Yes, a lot has happened since then. A lot has happened and uh, there's so much to dive into, but I feel naturally we'll focus probably on Ramdas and your upcoming Australia tour. For starters, how have you been with since the passing of beloved Ramdas? Well, it was it's funny because when we found out about it, we were having dinner with friends and those same friends are coming over tonight. So it's just like, it's sort of like when I just found out they were coming, I was sort of like, it brought up the memory of that night of sort of the shock of it. And it was a shock. It was, it was of course somewhat expected, I suppose, just because someone is of old age, but it also wasn't expected at all. And it was especially strange because we had just seen him in Maui, you know, maybe two weeks before that. So, uh, I don't know. It's been a mixture of sadness and 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 also sort of happy for him in some ways. And and then it was powerful to witness the absolute tsunami of energy that happened that day and the ensuing days. And all the points of connection that happened and all the ways like the world started to just explode into his world of Ram Dass's teachings. And, and so that in itself was just incredible to see. Mm, but I think I'm still kind of processing the whole thing, to be honest. Yeah. We've had your record on repeat since. Mm. And it's been really beautiful in... in processing it. It's been an interesting journey for us because naturally we wanted to hop straight on a plane and be a part of the ceremony of letting go of his body. But we had our own festival here. We were we needed to be here for and and your record yeah. was actually a huge ally in processing the grief and yeah, so I thank you for that on many levels, but in particular on that level of um, of really connecting with him and the teachings in such a soothing and it's like waves through that record of like moments of like it would bring tears of like, oh, wow, like of, of mourning and grief and then tears of, of bliss and celebration. And it really right. helped like the full spectrum of of, of grief and Right. Yeah. Again, I thank you. Really, really beautiful. Yeah, I felt the same way, and and it's just unbelievable and so remarkable how it all happened. Um, you know, he passed away basically on the the winter solstice up here, and and then that our last release, the reworks album, sort of remixes of the record, released in a culmination a couple days later, which we'd always planned on. And that was also the end of the year. And so my own sort of sense of closing of the project was happening. And I knew that. And and having that coincide with, it, with his death was pr- profound, to, to say the least. It's just been, an, I don't even know where to start, <laughs> you know, how it all fits together. And then thinking back on what it now, how that fits into the canon of his work, of Ram Dass's teachings, and you know, how it was pretty much, as far as I know, the last significant verbal teaching he gave, certainly recorded one. Um, after that one, at least when I saw him, he was speaking less and less and less and less. And his, his teaching was more through energy. Some, some writings that he'd done before. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know, all of that put together and it's just a bit too much to even handle. So I try not to handle it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the conversation on it almost doesn't seem... Um, even appropriate for a podcast. There's a lot of silent, yeah. a, a lot of silent kind of un, unspeakable, undescribable, but it, it does also feel good to bring it into conversation, into community conversation, because I think a lot of people are going through the same thing of of dealing with his passing, his dropping of the body. So uh, it does seem like a healthy thing to bring it into conversation as well. 
Yeah. I, yeah. What comes up for me is it feels like a time for us to pick up the mantle of his work. It's sort of like the baton is passed in a certain sense. Of mm-hmm. course, his teachings will always be here. And he has so many. We have so many resources. And it's time for us to do our work in our incarnation and to start doing living living the work walking the walk as much mm-hmm. as we can even more because i think that's really what i feel is being called on us mm-hmm. and that's something that there's a transmission there with with him dying yeah and, and stepping up to the plate totally couldn't agree more and the community around him is just exquisite like joe and i are, are naturally feeling even almost even more magnetism to go to his next retreat Mm. in which he won't even Mm -hmm. be physically present. But the teachers that have gathered around him and the musicians and the artists and just the the Sangha in general, we want to still deeply, deeply be a part of that, even though he's physically not going to be present. And we, over the years, have spent more and more time on Maui, naturally to be with him, in person, but we're still feeling the call to keep getting to Maui. And it, it's an interesting feeling, even though he's not physically there anymore. Um, that community that is gathered around him is yeah. just so beautiful. It's a great sangha. I'll, I'll be at the Maui retreat performing, which is pretty soon in May. And then, of course, what's nice about doing what I'm doing on tour, like in Australia, is that I'm sort of, I'm bringing uh, this, the live performance of his teachings, like his voice booming through the space and and working to create a form of living ceremony out of it. It's sort of an interesting hybridization of Ram Dass posthumously teaching, but he's... It, by collaborating through me playing it live, it's not just me playing a recording, it's me using it in a very dynamic way that's responding to the room in a ceremonial sense to have him teach alongside music. And it's been, an ama- it's been amazing to watch. And I haven't played any, I played one event since he passed uh, on New Year's Day. I did a ceremony here in Boise that we had already planned. And it's now kind of, it has this different, flavor to it because before I was just out there kind of like Ram Dass is over in Maui and I recorded him now I'm bringing this to you and we're going to we're going to play around with it and now it has this almost a different meaning and you you, you hear his words too with a, a different sense because mm-hmm. they have sort of these additional layers you know he's talking about death in that song like taking off an old shoe aka death it's like he's it, it's more prescient as if he's talking about his own future which he kind of was but now it really it's all there right yeah and in i am loving awareness at the end he's sort of fading away into the ether and you feel him you know and it really hits home Mm. yeah i'm really grateful the experience i had in mammoth with with you and radha uh most of that class i was literally in in tears and even though that was prior to him leaving the body there was still a of course a potency that was really palpable and yeah people are really lucky you're coming to australia and it's going to be a really beautiful and powerful experience for people the the country's going through a lot right now people are going through a lot the place is burning a lot of people are suffering and we we need we need stuff like this. So how are you feeling about coming over at these interesting times for our country? Well, I'm glad you bring that up because I'm thinking about it a lot. And yeah. we're many thousands of miles away, so it's hard to know what's really happening. We just see it through the filter of the news. Um, and then I may, I've been able to talk to a few people like you, you know, individuals. That's always the best. Just to be like, what's going on with you? And you know, what's going on with your community? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the whole reason I'm going down was because uh, Radha's doing a self-awakening yoga workshop over a weekend in, in Sydney, in Merrickville. And I think it's at Inner Space Yoga. So she's doing that, which is this public event. And I thought, oh, I'd like to maybe go with her. So I just thought I'd see if I could get a few dates together. And it turned into a, a tour. I think it's eight or nine events. And... At that time, obviously, the fires weren't happening or anything like that. And then when that started to emerge, 
I really had to look at why we're going and and what it is I have to offer. Because obviously the last thing you want to do is be a distraction. And I've that's like the opposite of my whole ethos anyway. I'm always trying to help people clear out the noise and find their, their center and their own intuitive truth. And that's what I want to bring on this this tour is events that are of service to you and your community. I mean, we're just fellow human beings and I don't live there. So I'm witnessing, okay, your home is going through a massive transformation. And right now, as a country, collectively, you guys are at the spear tip of the kind of change that we're all going through this birth canal of transformation, which is often ugly and challenging and bloody. And you know, it's a mess. And it's full of anger and it's full of, of everything. And it's a kind of death. And when I think about Ramdas and what we're talking about, there's a certain, there's a kind of death as a form of transformation. So Ramdas said it's like taking off an old shoe, but the ego sees it as an, an end, but the soul sees it as sort of a new beginning. And I think there's different lenses we can look at what's going on down there. And I don't pretend to know all the causes or the whys or even what's next, but I can say, I can sort of hold it just as a fellow human and say, hey, I, I see that this is really hard and let's hold that, you know, a lot is going on here and something, things are radically changing very quickly and that is so hard. And I, my heart is going out to everyone who's there. And what we need right now is there have to be moments of repose so that we can regain our own strength, connect with our community, connect with ourselves, have moments to recharge, to connect with ourselves and be like, all right, what's really important to me? What do I need to do? What's my soul's purpose? Not forget that. Sometimes we can get really lost in the chaos of the happening. But in that chaos, there is a a newness being born that's easy to not be able to see inside the flames. And so all I want to do is, is create a small amount of space and, and invite people to come in. And I just want to sit there and hold them and give them a, a space with music to be able to hear and be able to listen to whatever they need to listen to. There's no proselytizing on my part. It's really just to offer space. Mm. Yeah. It's needed. Um, I keep hearing people saying this is Australia's 9-11, you know, and... Wow. Uh, and it definitely feels like that in the in the horror of it and the catastrophe of it. It it is bringing people together, and it is birthing a a deeper wisdom and compassion already. You know, um, what's going on with you? I mean, tell me a bit about it. What it's been going on for you guys? Well, here on the west coast, it hasn't been anywhere near as catastrophic or or. or or intense, but we've we've had a lot of bushfires still. For example, last week, uh, as we were in preparation for our festival, for Flow Festival, um, literally the day before the first day, um, so that would have been the Wednesday a week ago, mm-hmm. um, there was a pretty big fire that I was literally driving into on the way up to our site. Wow. And... Um, helicopters and fire engines and it, it, it was spreading quickly it was a windy day it was the it was quote unquote the perfect conditions to just spread that fire real fucking quick so um i was quite literally driving into it to get to where i needed to go and mm. got got through it um all the roads weren't quite blocked off this was early in the fire got to our land um, and as soon as I got there we, we don't have good connection there we're quite off the grid mm-hmm. but but little messages would come through here and there and on the way up I did call Joe I'm like this this fire does not look good I, I can tell it just began but keep wow. keep up to date like uh, just keep an eye on it and um, and mm-hmm. try to let us know what's going on Um. And she did instantly check it out and there were warnings of evacuate, et cetera. And she's like, this doesn't look good. This could be truly a catastrophe. Like, um, So we got in contact with the fire warden 
And they gave us the all clear to be there. They said, it doesn't need to be evacuated. It's going the other way. But our community, they were, they were freaking out. It was looking like we had to cancel this festival. And um, Naturally. It, yeah, yeah. And, and people are in high anxiety because of how bad the fires have been around the country. So people were on high alert and high anxiety. And um, yeah, a lot of people were freaking out and very concerned for us um, because we were in this bushland that was very vulnerable. But while we were there, I mean, it was perfect. Like you couldn't imagine a more perfect, clear, calm surrounding yet just a few miles away, this fire was raging. But they they got onto it early and they got, got it under control. Um, and that's been happening almost daily around here, a bushfire here, a bushfire there. But thankfully, they've been getting onto them early and there's been enough resources to put them out. But um, can't get complacent. I mean, it can easily turn into what's happened on the East Coast um, in, a, in a moment, in a day, you know. So we're thankful that we were able to do Flow Festival and it was actually really powerful and really beautiful and a lot of prayer and a lot of ceremony and a lot of connection to the water and uh, connecting to this huge catastrophe around our country. But for us, it has been quite perfect and no one's been, as far as I know, um, too affected by the fires that have happened here. They've been managed pretty well. But I mean, just just over the continent, it's been, been fucking crazy, you know? So um, yeah, I mean, we also get kind of what you're getting, the, 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 the lens of the media. You know, it's hard to get uh, right. uh, the truth of what's going on. So I try to also connect with people I know that are either uh, dealing with it or close to it. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's full on. It's very, very full on. Well, it's definitely a manifestation of... Well, all the things that we feel and think about here it is in reality you know it's just massive change happening very quickly Mm -hmm. and challenges left and right yeah and it's waking it's tough yeah and i really hope it'll it will have that awakening effect I, i i do think it is but time will tell you know we'll see but uh i'm seeing that Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, we're all witnessing it and mm-hmm. we're with you as much as we can be. And i am be flying into it real soon. So then I'll yeah. be traveling a lot. So it'll be interesting to see how that all goes. You know, it will be. Around. It will be. And uh, wishing you so much strength and your first location in, in Sydney, yeah? Yeah, there's three dates in the Sydney area first. That's great. Mm-hmm. And then we're working our way down. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm sorry the uh, the Perth dates didn't work out. We'll be we'll be like flying out on the tail end of your tour as you're um, oh, okay. as you're deep into it. But yeah. it looks like the East Coast is in for a real real treat with you. It's going to be beautiful. Oh well, the honor is on mine, and I'm really looking forward to meeting the community out there and uh, just connecting with this whole other part of the world that I've never been to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so cool. I mean, in Mammoth, we were toying with the idea and playing with it. And I remember um, the kind of... Yeah, you were. You, you, I could. I could feel you ticking over, like how to how to make <laughs> Australia happen. And a couple months later, it's happening. It's really cool to see. Yeah, we're just doing this on our own, so it's a bit of a, a risk. We're just putting it all together and fronting the costs. And it just felt like the right thing to do and the time to do it. And now that all this is happening, I'm sort of like, oh, okay. I see. It's like this is uh, this is a service trip. And um, I think it'll be beautiful too. Uh, I know mm-hmm. it will be, of course. Um, but I, I don't fully understand it all. I'm just sort mm-hmm. of um, taking the steps to, to continue moving forward mm-hmm. as best we can. So it'll be great. Um, for those of the guests that are maybe um, 
on the fence. They haven't committed to it yet. Can you kind of help them envision what what you'll be offering? Sure. Yeah. Yes. It's it's called East Forest Ceremony, which is something that I've been developing over the last year and year or so. And I've always been interested in how we can make the live music experience deeper and more powerful. I'm sure a lot of us have had powerful moments of emotional connection at music events, but I was kind of like, how could we reliably do that even more? So I wanted to combine elements of ritual and ceremony into the mixture of a concert. Because my, my music started in the ceremonial space, mostly in the shamanic space. So I have this background of leading ceremony and meditative shamanic ceremony. And so I wanted to bring in uh, elements, very simple elements of basically guided meditation and some simple ritual. Uh, typically, we do these events in the round. So I'm in the middle and we're all in it together. And it's sort of an immersive audio experience. And in, in the middle, I have my live setup, which is a live, there's like pianos and keyboards and my vocals and my field recordings and my stems of like Ram Dass and and things like that. And my looping pedals. So I can kind of create this and perform live. I can also move around the room a bit. And the idea is that you can you can sit or you can lie down and really just drop in. And I'm giving some little cues here and there. And we're doing some little small rituals. Some of it involves like writing a little bit down. And this is all kind of a mixture of brain science and ancient forms of technology, of ways that we're communicating with the deeper layers of our consciousness to be able to plant seeds and access these parts of our unconscious, uh, these layers of our heart, and to make meaningful changes in our lives. And my goal is to clear away the noise that is always sort of around us through our habits and routines and our thoughts and all the things we have to do. And through this technology of, of music and using it in an intentional way, So that music is doing things to entrain your brain, which is a form of relaxation, um, kind of inducing a kind of trance state so that you can just really be still. And in that stillness, I'm hoping really hear what's always there, which is you, which is your own intuitive voice, your own truth. And in this experience, it can speak to you. And hopefully you can make some choices about what kind of seeds you want to plant in your life moving forward. And so it's an opportunity... The ceremony is one of opening to yourself and discovering the kernels of truth that are you. And um, that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to bring to the table. So I'm trying to make it a very beautiful space, ethereal space. And uh, you, could, you could come there. You don't need to know anything either. I mean, this is open to everyone. You could come with any religious background or no religious background. It doesn't matter. This is a secular event, but I feel it's a deeply spiritual event, but one that needs no prior beliefs. All you need is an open mind to say, I'm willing to listen. That's it. I'm willing to listen for at least an hour and a half and relax. <laughs> and, and we'll see what comes out of that. Mm. And I would bet, judging on how we've done it before, um, it, it could be some some bliss and some rejuvenation and some pretty pretty powerful insights. Mm, beautiful, and there's such power to. I mean, someone could just put on the record and listen to it and have a beautiful experience. Yes, but there's so much power to the to the live experience. On um, sure, yeah. On yeah, last Friday I ran a, a workshop type journey experience and. I got people soul gazing, eye gazing one to one for 20 minutes. And the backtrack was um, a couple of your songs with Ram Dass, I'm Loving Awareness and Past the Bliss and um, one other song, I forget which one. And a lot of the people hadn't, hadn't listened to it. And uh, oh, that's awesome. And uh, these were a lot of new students as well that hadn't even heard Ramdas. And some oh of the sh- yeah, some of the sharings were like a bit of confusion at the beginning of like because it was good to hear actually because I've been listening to Ramdas for so long now and it's just in the background of my awareness. It's constantly there. But then to hear people that have never heard his voice, never heard of Ramdas, never heard of you, and shift from that initial like uh, almost 
discomfort of like him repeating, I am loving awareness and I love my wheelchair. And I lo- like, it's yeah. for some people, it's completely out there. Um, oh, yeah. Thoughts, you know. So to shift, to see them and hear them share as well from that shift of like, what the fuck is this all about, you know? <laughs> to them, That's what like, I like about music too, yes. because it, uh, you know, I play music in the experience that is also not the quote, Ram Dust music, my own other music that's instrumental. Mm-hmm. And what's great about that is there's no lyrical content to activate that part of your brain. It's purely emotional. It's right. purely it's just an emotional response to the music itself. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about that, how it builds those bridges yeah. in our minds and amongst people and in our hearts. Yeah. And I think it really does, um, again, just on the on the Ram Dust experience for these soul gazers, uh, that shift from not quite getting the teaching, but I think almost undoubtedly that the music slides it in, kind of like the, mm-hmm. the, the sugar for the, for the medicine, you know, it just slides it right in and seeing that shift mm-hmm. into, into bliss and insight right in front of my own eyes was really cool to see. And this was a room full of um, a lot of very busy corporate um, they weren't yogis, you know, not many of them anyway. Very busy, very um, highly strung. And even then, whew, that, that, that makes me shift. Happy. So, it was so beautiful. Really, I mean, really that's beautiful. who I really, honestly, my, my target, if I had to have a target, it's um, the people who believe the least. The people who, uh, you know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I love playing for the faithful and the choir because it's just like a bliss fest. But I also love like the cowboys and <laughs> yeah. the folks who are like so skeptical and then watching is like, if you just give me an inch, please just give me an inch and I'll get in there. And then you'll just be like, it's because it's a universal experience. The kind of chord structures and melodies and rhythms I'm using go back thousands of years is how they resonate across cultures. And so it's like, you will feel some things, right? And it's just coming from you from the mm. inside out. And it's a private internal experience. It's sort of like, why not, man? Just go there. I, no one's judging. No one will know. Yeah. You know. It's like, if that's the thing you're worried about, um, there's value in it for everyone. It builds bridges. Mm. Yeah, incredible. Are you going to be um, collaborating with Radha on this trip or is she doing her thing? You're doing No, yours. She, she's doing her um, training workshop uh, that's open to anyone to go. Uh, I, I believe you can sign up on Eventbrite. And that's on, it's like February 15th and 16th. Okay. So it's like a weekend and she's doing that during the day. And then I have some events in the evening. And then when she's done with that weekend at Inner Space Yoga, um, you know, we continue on to the next city and the next and so forth. So we just kind of keep going down. It's like two weeks in Australia. Cool. I'd love for us, I don't think in our previous episode together, we um, went into your journey and what brought you to all of this. We were focusing mainly on Ram Dass and Be Here, Be Now. Um, but I'd love to hear more about your journey personally, and I'd love for our listeners to get to know how how all this came about. You did touch upon that your music journey kind of began from the ceremonial context, but yeah, yes. please go a little bit deeper into how this all came about and how the Ramdas connection did come about. Please run us through it. Well, it's. I mean, I don't know where to start without it being obsequious and long, but I can tell you this, that I, I had a lot of awakenings. I was a tough nut to crack in my twenties. You know, I grew up as a typical American in suburbs, uh, white and privileged in the middle class of America. And I didn't have, I was deeply depressed. Like I didn't have any connection or elders really to understand what it means to be alive or any of these things. Yet I've always been a real creative soul and and inquisitive person, but I had no path. And I I dabbled in different religions and so forth. And I always enjoyed creative things in the arts as a as a way, as an outlet. But there was there was always something I was yearning for. And nothing really opened me up until I had uh, an experience with psychedelic mushrooms. 
and the, I stumbled into that. Thankfully, it was positive in college. It was my first experience. And it was the first time I saw that there was something more and so much more, but I didn't know what to make of it or do with it. All I knew is it was incredible and it felt more real than real. Many years went by of me not really knowing what to do with that experience. Um, And I think I didn't really come back to understanding it until my late 20s or around when I turned 30. I was living in New York City and this was in 2008. And a friend of mine went to an ayahuasca ceremony. And this was back when ayahuasca wasn't really as prevalent. It was just starting to be in some underground circles. It certainly was not something everyone was doing. (laughs) And it was not something, uh, all I had heard about it was one Rolling Stone article uh, profiling Daniel Pinchbeck. (laughs) And it was mentioning that he was in an apartment in Brooklyn in an ayahuasca ceremony wearing a diaper and had a vomit bucket with an eye shade. And I was just like, why would anyone want to do this? This is the worst endorsement I'd ever heard. So my friend later on is like, told me he'd done this with these Peruvian shamans. And he just said to me, he's like, when are you going to do it? I was like, when am I going to do it? I have no plans to do this. That sounds really tough. But eventually he encouraged me to listen to what was calling me. And I, I continued to do that. And long story short, I eventually did engage in one of these ceremonies. And that was sort of my introduction into indigenous ceremony. And as the universe would have it, it was just the right timing. It was at a time in my life, of like my Saturn returns of, of change and, and searching and other things were falling apart in my life that was opening up new doorways for new opportunities. So I was deeply seeking and I had opportunity to seek. So I just went in head first. So I started... Also, without thinking about making music for myself, and I I wanted to make music that I could use in a psilocybin space for myself to try to get to the places I had been way back when I was younger in college and other other random experiences in my life where I felt like I touched a certain infinity, a soul space, but I didn't understand what it was. I just wanted to get back to that, to return to God in a sense. And music was a pathway at times. So I started making music for myself. And before that, I was doing like pop groups and piano stuff, really, you know, really trying to quote, make it. And it was sort of commercial. And it wasn't, it was competent, but I don't think anything more than that. And I was also an actor in New York City. That was like my day job. And that's a whole nother world of Hollywood that I was sort of trying to make it in as well. And all this was sort of falling apart. I was like, I don't want to be part of this system and that system. And Uh, I made some music over the course of a year. And in this year, I've been doing ayahuasca ceremonies and learning from the shamans or doing a Lakota sweat lodge and learning or doing a peyote or a uh, wachume ceremony. And all of them using music, right? All of them in different ways. And these are old, ancient, multi-millennia traditions. And I'm noticing these similarities in what they're doing with the music. And then I'm starting to read, listen and read about sound healing quote unquote, sort of modern science of what we know, what we are doing to the brain. And I tried to put this all together and through my own taste in this music I was making, I was just trying to engender a kind of feeling for myself. And it became what what became my first record. I wasn't intending it really to be a commercial record, nor was there any project attached to it named East Forest at the time. But I made this record And uh, because it was inspired by initially the idea of psilocybin, of mushrooms, I thought, you know, to end this project, I'm going to take some mushrooms as a kind of little ceremony to honor the the idea and the inception. So the record was kind of done. It was 44 minutes long. I took the mushrooms in my apartment in Brooklyn by myself, and I went on a little walk waiting for them to kick in. I remember I was around the Brooklyn Bridge. I lived near there. I started to feel them. I was like, okay, time to go back. Went back. I was really feeling the medicine. I'm like, okay, put on the headphones, just like these ones I'm wearing. Lay on my bed, reached over to my computer, hit play and close my eyes. And my life changed. <laughs> I mean, I had the most incredible experience where the medicine allowed me to uh, no longer be able to understand or follow how I had made the music, which of course I was intimately involved with. I just spent... I knew you know, all the little 
all the little twists and turns. Now it's like I was witnessing it anew. And not only that, because it involved all these field recordings of the last year, I was getting into putting in like sounds of nature and the city, but just incidental sounds of people talking. It's everywhere I'd been for the last year. All the people that had my family in it, all the places I'd been. It was like, this was my last journey of the last year and all the self-discovery. And it was so remarkable. All the, It was just loaded with synchronicity to the point where it's just exploding my heart of like, I couldn't believe the synchronicity. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever experienced where like my soul had tricked my ego into making this record as a tool, an art piece for me to use in that moment with the psilocybin so that I could essentially pop through into another form of being on my incarnation and my journey. So it was remarkably beautiful. Which record never, is that, by the way, for people? To... And so that became my first record, which is called The Education of the Individual Soul. Right. And I, I took off the headphones and I remember the room was like flexing kind of like in the matrix. And I just was like, I felt like a new being. And ever since then, to make a long story short, I started sharing that music for free. That record is still free, by the way, on my website. It's a, a gift and it always will be. It's not that many people download, but back then that was a bigger deal. That was the only way to listen to music. And it became a tool for other people for self-discovery. And then I started, a friend started uh, organizing ceremonies for me to lead. And I was stepping into that role and then did that for several years. Um, And that was all I did was just sort of these dark private circles, dark meaning in the darkness. And I learned a lot through that and I started developing more of a kind of quote sound or lexicon of music. And that's why the music I do sounds the way it does uh, because it was created for that space. And then around 2014, 2015, I kind of felt this intuitive message. It was time to take it out more into the public light away from the private darkness or not just not only that. And I started going through this laborious process of trying to figure out how to do that. And I didn't know. I mean, how do, who, who's going to listen to third, you know, long form, experimental, ambient, uh, hippie music, so to speak? <laughs> but my influences were in 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 pop, in classical, in hip hop, uh, in jazz, and so I I still feel that way. And I think that's why my records in electronic, you know, they have a mixture of all these different genres. Mm. And I had all this experience of writing hooks and writing songs like classic songwriting. And that's still the bedrock of my work where I want it to be experimental, but I want it to be engaging. I want it to be uh, have melody. I don't want it to just be noise. I want it to be emotional, deeply emotional, because that's what I want. And that's what I always was looking for, something to help me, inspire me and, and help me to feel that infinite space. So I've been exploring that ever since then. And I've, there's been 22 releases since that first one the last one being this reworks album of the Ramdas record and you know doing things like the Ramdas record 10 years later it just it just blows my mind that it blows my mind that I'm going to Australia to p- do public ceremonies it's almost like coming full circle like I'm not obviously doing a psilocybin ceremony I'm just sort of saying well look I'm holding that kind of space because it's a universal space I realize that this is not a spe- specific thing just for certain people. It's about being human. And I can do this in a way that's a, that's accessible to everyone. And I'm really proud that this is the kind of experience that, as I said before, anyone could walk into and I think have a meaningful experience and feel welcomed. You don't have to be part of the quote club. Yeah. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that gives you some background, but totally. Yeah. And beautiful to get to know your your journey and you a little bit more keeps unfolding. Do you feel that we can have a mystical experience such as what psilocybin can unlock within just with sound or no sound and just being... I mean, the short answer is yes, for sure. Sound can be a weapon. Sound can be... It's a power... It's ultrasound. means all sorts of things. But for me, I don't know if I could have, I th- or I think I could have, but I needed that extra kick to kind of help 
put it all together and make it really like right in front of my face. Like I needed the billboard right across my eyes. And that's just the kind of thick nut that I am that needed to crack. I've met many other much more sensitive people that do not need uh, such intensity to get the message. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I've witnessed it many times before in the ceremonies where, um, you know, of course they're not imbibing any substances other than they're just coming with their consciousness and relaxing and working through the protocol that I'm giving them of like, Hey, you know, in this moment, I want you to take three deep breaths. Now I'm going to ask you to just listen for 30 seconds. If something comes to you, I want you to write it down, you know, try Mm -hmm. to get into one word, just a couple little things here and there. And they have, I've seen deeply, deeply transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in that sense, yes, I think it can be done through music. Yeah. I think so too. And again, back to this soul gazing experiment, well, not experiment, exercise, kind of an experiment, I guess. Um, It was quite psychedelic for people. And uh, I often find the longer we do it, the more psychedelic it gets, Mm. like the power of our attention, you know, of, of paying undivided attention, no words, just eye to eye, some sound maybe backing that, which, I mean, in in most of the shamanic methodology, sound is such a vital part of a of a good, thorough, and skillful journey. The sound kind of is the the it's typically the vehicle. The for vehicle, it, actually, yeah, it's, yeah. I would say it's it's almost central in mm-hmm. most ceremonies. And knowing that shows you what it's used for. It's a for it's a tool. And so the intentionality that needs to be brought to that is critically important. And I think we should trust in the way certain indigenous cultures have learned this and what kind of technology they've developed through sound and music over thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And you can just, you know, they're very strict in how they do these ceremonies. For instance, the Lakota Sweat Lodge, because they want to maintain the technology. If, if you change it a little bit every generation, it starts to then drift into a completely different thing. It's like a game of telephone, you know? So, yeah, um, it's all there. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that, that we could pick up and use in modern um, psychedelic assisted therapy that they kind of yet to pick up that true mantle of on the level of sound and music. But right. I think they will. And that's one of the reasons I made the Music for Mushrooms album, because I saw that there was a there was a hole there to be filled. Mm hmm. Yeah, and the the long format that you were touching upon before, I think it feels like the antidote for our current times where people are flipping from song to song so fucking quickly. So the um, attention span is kind of getting crunched as technology goes the way it's going. But there does seem to be like similar to these long format conversations and podcasts that people are yearning for and really digging these long format journey soundscapes are i think a great antidote for our current times yeah it's the kryptonite for mm-hmm. modern life and it's very human and it's very needed it's just it's, 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 it's in proportion to what everything else is going on and the speed of it and so we're just looking for balance and it's mm-hmm. nature is always trying to do that and we're part of nature it's trying to create that balance right now in your, in, in your life, in your incarnation. Mm. Something you said just before um, uh, triggered a thought of why mantras for so long in, in yoga methodologies and tantra, uh, a, a lot of mantras have been kept secret. And a lot of modern yogis wonder why, like why, why would these mantras be kept secret? And it brought me to that notion of of uh, preserving the power of it because it's so mm-hmm. easy to k- kind of bastardize the the power of it. And Ram Dass often spoke about that with his his name. Even when he first came back to the West, with his name, people would make fun of him because of his name. And before you know it, it's become bastardized and and kind of made a bit uh, dirty. Similar thing with these mantras and so forth, often the the teacher will not share it until it's fully like respected, fully honored and and one is ready for it. And I think there's kind of, there's beauty to that. I think the power trip can be exploited as well. 
but also that real respect of the power of that that method, the power of that song, the power of the mantra and so forth. What do you feel about Certain, that? Certainly there's, I think, ancient technology and those mantras and the actual sounds themselves are a kind of alchemy and spell. And I also, I mean, what, what I hear in that is my radar goes up about like, oh, that's the priest class trying to keep people right. in subjugation. So I'm like, mm-hmm. we're at a time now where like, we can all have direct experience. We do not need to have the go-betweens between us and quote God because mm-hmm. it's it's all inside us. And I think that was an old model where the priests were like, look, you guys are too stupid to understand this. So, you know, we'll drink the Soma and we'll let you know what the teachings yes. are. Uh, that, now sure. it's a whole, the, the, everything's blowing up. It's like, no, we can all drink the Soma. Mm-hmm. And it sort of like the way like, certain plants and fungi are illegal. They come out of the ground. It's like, it's absurd. It's like, look, it's our choice. If anything, we should just be teaching people tools and smart use and not saying you can't do it. It's right there. They're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't stop it from growing. So it's silly. It doesn't make sense that we're saying you're not allowed to explore your conscious. Only reason you would if you think it's a threat to a kind of system or order that already exists and that order is essentially working from fear because it wants to maintain its power. Yeah, great answer, man. That That's bang on. And I think that's exactly it, that reverence and that skillful application. I mean, to anything, you know, to the plant medicines. I mean, it seems like we're in a time of just kind of... working it out, you know? It kind of yeah, blew I mean, up... For a People period will there. fall on their faces for sure. And yeah. that's, unf- that's part of the process, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think our job is more care and education and information as opposed to um, abstinence or laws against it. It's like, it just never works. Yeah. So we see it time and time again. And it doesn't mean mistakes aren't going to be made. They are. But I mean, unfortunately, we, that's just part of the journey. So let's just do our best to mitigate what's going to happen resources love yeah 2020 my man so australia's coming up what else is happening in this coming year oh i'm sure lots lots of performing and making more music and new collaborations um i mean right now i'm sitting in this studio here in boise that i just finished building and so i'm i'm curious to see what come out of this space and these pianos and um I'm, there's lots of things I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about and working on, but um, everything's kind of in early embryonic states. Beautiful. Yeah, your studio is looking sweet. You put a lot of energy yeah. into creating that in a, in a very yeah. precise and flowing way. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I've been working hard on this, and I've always wanted a space kind of like this. And it's soon to be, after I get back from Australia, I'll get these pianos ready, tuned up, and there's some repair going on, get everything set up so it can be just sort of a very flowing workflow. And uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. You know, we're mm-hmm. continuing to do the retreats. Uh, Rod and I do one in Utah in the fall in the U.S. And at Esalen, we, we teach out there. I'm sure there'll be some other things added, but that's all that's on my website. And social media, all that kind of jazz. Beautiful. Well, folks in Australia, make sure you get to East Forest Offerings. I'll leave links below. And yeah, we're really excited and honored to get you over here. Well, honor's all mine again. And it is it is a lot of work to be getting over there. We're doing everything we can, whether it's the visas or figuring out how to get all the gear there and how to get around the country. But I do see it as an act of service. So I'm just really looking forward to making the most of it and hoping that, you know, basically that if anyone wants to go, that they just know about it. And so I really Mm -hmm. appreciate you helping get the word out and anyone listening, if they want to invite a friend or just do anything to help spread the word, because I think it it could be helpful right now. And I think it's something we often forget. We put on the back, the back burner about self-care in times of deep stress and transition. So it's, it's really one of, um, that when usually we get into that intuitive space and intuitive knowledge, it's one where you yourself want to be in the service about interconnectedness. So it should be one that is not divisive, but one that's an energy of 
of healing. And so I, I'm looking yeah. forward to bringing it. Couldn't agree more. And again, can't emphasize again the importance of that live transmission. There's something so special about being there with you, the creator of this music, with the Sangha, that it'll undoubtedly attract a really beautiful group of people to each event. And that's what and we it's need a right now. Yeah, conversation. It's, it's, you know, it's not just me giving you something. Like the mm -hmm. reason I'm doing it live and looping is because I'm sort of, there's this element of improvisation in the moment, and that's in mm -hmm. the response to our energetic conversation. So it's, it's different every time and it's, it's unique to the moment and ephemeral. Mm. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for everything you do and I look forward to catching up with you and Radha, hopefully very soon. Yeah, thanks, thank you. Thanks for your time, East Forest. Much love, Ram Ram. Cheers, cheers. <laughs>